Thank you, Mark. We are in chapter 17 this morning in our studies in Jeremiah. We're going to cover verses 1 through 18, but I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. And I'm doing something different this morning than I normally do. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV, because I like its translation of some verses better than the translation in the New American Standard Bible. We'll be back in the New American Standard next week, but uh, I'm reading from the ESV this week. So beginning with verse 1 through 14. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and the Asherim beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains, in the open country, your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave to you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the ear of drought, for he, does not, for he does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds." Like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by justice. In the midst of his days they will leave him, and at his end he will be a fool. A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in prayer. A number of years ago, I gave myself a project, realized I needed to become a little more literate, and so the project was to read at least one of Shakespeare's plays every year. I did that for, for some time and read a number of them. What I found was Shakespeare didn't have the solution, but he understood the problem. He never gives the gospel as far as I read, but he had great insight into human nature. One of his best lines is in Julius Caesar. Cassius was plotting to kill Caesar and to encourage his friend to join the conspiracy, he said, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Now that's literature, not history, it's Shakespeare, but it is true. And the very point Jeremiah made in Jeremiah 17, the problem is inside of us. Time is out of joint, another line from the bard. The world is not as it should be. 
We all know that. We know that from the newspaper. We know that from the evening news. The world is insane. The history of the human race is written in blood. But the reason is not the world generally, but ourselves specifically. The fault is in ourselves, in our souls. And we will never arrive at the solution to the problem until we recognize the cause of it. Well, Jeremiah gives it here in chapter 17 and verse 9. We considered this verse somewhat last week. It's good to go over this point because it's an essential point in understanding who we are and really understanding the Word of God. It's one of the most precise and withering descriptions of the human condition anywhere written. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We have sick souls. Until the heart condition is fixed, a person will be ailing and things out of joint. Now that is true in principle of the world as a whole, as the human of the human race as a whole. But Jeremiah has a specific audience here. He's explaining this to his people, to Judah. He's giving them the reason for the, for the reason why they were in such great trouble. You remember from last week in chapters four and chapter six, there's the prophecy of this evil from the north that was coming down upon the nation. Judgment was coming on the people of God. All through the book of Jeremiah, the message of judgment is given like a constant drumbeat. It's the subject of the previous chapter, chapter 16. Deadly diseases were coming. They would die by sword and famine, and their bodies would be food for the birds. Very graphic language that the prophet uses. It's a grim prophecy of a dim future, but it was just. It was righteous. They were guilty. Their sin was ingrained deeply in their souls. Chapter 17 begins with that indictment. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. A pen of iron was a stylus or a tool tipped with a hard substance like a diamond or flint to engrave inscriptions on stone. And words were written in stone so that they couldn't be erased. That was Judah's condition. The people's sin and guilt were so deep in their inner beings that nothing in the Old Covenant, the, none of the offerings at the temple or the ceremonies of the law could remove them, could remove the sin and the guilt that they had. They were a faithless people, an apostate people. That's indicated by this reference to the horns of their altars. You'll notice that word altars is plural. It's not referring to the altar at the temple. These are altars to pagan gods, altars to Baal and the other deities of the surrounding nations. They were everywhere. In verse 2, Jeremiah mentions the Asherim beside every green tree on the high hills. Images of the Canaanite goddess Asherah were set up in, in groves among trees. It was a fertility cult. These were sites located on high places, on the mountains that surround Jerusalem. If you've been there, you know that there's the mountain on which Jerusalem is established, but there are higher mountains, Mount of Olives, Mount Scopus, Mount, other mountains all around. Those were the high places. Not only there, but they were all through the hilly land of Judah. Wherever there was a high place, there was an altar to some god. Judah, the people of God. Judah was guilty of many sins, but this is how it began in their spiritual decline. False gods. And really, that's the way it begins with any nation. Turning away from the revelation of God in Scripture for those who possess it, in nature for those who don't. There's revelation in nature that the Gentiles turned away from. That's Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, 
but became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. So they became idolaters. They worshiped the creation rather than the creator. They exchanged, Paul said, the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They worshiped reptiles and bugs. As a result, Paul wrote, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. That was the Gentiles. But it's also the Jews. That's what Jeremiah describes here. When people turn away from God's revelation, He lets them have what they want. They believe error, philosophically, theologically, and become immoral. That was Judah's condition, and the result would be judgment. The people of Judah would lose their inheritance, their home in Canaan, and they would go off to a foreign land. Verse 4, I will make you serve your enemies. Again, it's this drumbeat throughout the book of Jeremiah, this judgment. The next set of verses, verses 5 through 8, is a short poem resembling Psalm 1. It uh, may be Jeremiah's confession of faith and faithfulness in contrast to Judah's faithlessness that we see here in the first four verses. Psalm 1 begins, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Here, verse 5 begins, Cursed is the man who does that. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Now that curse could be applied to any of Judah's last kings. We may see this as we continue our studies. Jehoiakim or Zedekiah, because that's just what they did. Uh, in order to get security from this threat of the Babylonian army, they looked not to the Lord, they looked to the Gentiles. They looked to Egypt. They looked to Pharaoh and his armies. But this is more general than that and applies to people broadly. This is typical of human conduct in, in every age and in every place. People depend on the flesh for strength, they depend on man, on their own abilities rather than the Lord. It's natural to do that. We, we uh, think we know best. We trust our wits, our own judgment or that of others. We trust the smart people. We lean on our own understanding. It's natural, as I said, but that's what Proverbs 28 verse 26 warns against. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Now that's not Dan Duncan speaking. That's, that's Solomon. That's the word of God. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. The wise person trusts in the Lord, which is to say trusts in Scripture, the word of God. That's the rest of this brief poem or song. Verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. That's the man or woman who has read deeply the Word of God, taken it in, made it part of his or her understanding a part of their mind and how they look at life and live by it, obey its instruction, yield to it. It, it grounds us in reality. And look, we, don't, we have no way to understand what reality is apart from the revelation of God. Take this away and we're all, we all live by speculation. It's the Word of God that informs us what reality is past, present, and future. And it's through the Word of God that God has revealed to us, that we know Him and we learn of His grace and we learn of His sovereignty. So as we study it and we know it, we trust in Him and follow His guidance. And that's the very thing that's missing in the idolater. 
He lacks confidence in the sovereignty of God, in who he is, in his righteousness, in his faithfulness. And so he puts his confidence in other things. Puts his confidence in human force. Or puts his confidence in some other kind of false god. Even in a secular age, we have our gods. We talked about that last week as well. But it's true. We're in a secular age, but uh, we have gods. It may be health or wealth, it may be sex, or power, whatever a man serves, whatever he trusts in is his God. But things can't give wisdom or life, and they certainly can't rescue us in time of great peril. Those who are grounded in the Bible are well established in the truth. They have the foundation in life that enables them to get through the droughts and tough times, to live wisely and well. Now that's mystifying to the world, the, the very idea that this ancient book is relevant for today is something that the world just doesn't get. And so it doesn't see the principles of life by which we can live by here. In fact, the gospel the good news of salvation, of forgiveness and eternal life, of reconciliation with God and reconciliation with man. That gospel is foolishness to the natural man, as is all of the Word of God. And that's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. A natural man, he said, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. The revelation of God Divine light is darkness to the natural man. Now, why is that? Why do people reject what you see so clearly? Now, you're here because you want to hear the Word of God. And why? Because you believe it's the Word of God and it's light. And so you accept, you, you accept it, you believe it. Why is it that so many in the world do not? And instead they lean on the flesh and they trust in idols and ideas, isms. We have a world, a world full of isms. Secularism, materialism, atheism, pantheism, solipsism. You name it, there are more than that. Why do people believe in everything imaginable from Jupiter and Juno back then to Buddha or Darwin now? Everything but the truth. Well, Jeremiah gives us the answer in verse 9. The fault is in ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? If this were the only verse in the Bible that we had on the soul of man, it would be enough to debunk and disprove the modern conceit of the basic goodness of man. And that's what people want to believe. That's what they want to think of themselves. They're basically good people. And we have problems and we need to tweak it sometimes, but we're basically good. I'm okay, you're okay. And the heart has limitless resources to feed that deception. The book, Ordinary Men, is the account of a unit of middle-aged Germans from Hamburg who committed atrocities against thousands of Polish Jews during World War II. Now, they weren't criminals conscripted into the army. They weren't even ardent Nazis. Just average men from working class backgrounds, ordinary men, who were given orders and willingly became executioners of men and women and children. So the book analyzes that and it tries to explain it. And Jeremiah has explained it already. The heart of man is desperately sick and it has an unlimited capacity for deception and rationalizing evil into acceptable behavior. That's the human heart. Now we don't deny that men do good things. People fought Nazis. People saved Jews. People give their wealth to charities often risk their lives fighting fires. Men do good things. Jesus acknowledged that. He said in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. 
The good in this world, and there is good in this world, is due to God's common grace. And when we do it, whoever we are who do it, it's because we have that remnant of the image of God in which man was created. We all bear that image. It's a, it's a wrecked image, but there's enough of it there that we do things that are right and have some understanding of things. But still, Jesus said, you are evil. And really, the great evil and the origin of all sin is unbelief. That's what characterizes the human heart. It's an unbelieving heart. It's John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, that men hate the light. That's what he said. So the heart, the mind, has all kinds of sophisticated ways to deny and reject the light of God. Men use philosophy and science to justify their unbelief so that they can continue to live on their own terms and not God's terms. Hebrews 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, that is a verse for today and for this age that's obsessed with science. How do we know how the world came into being? We know it by faith, faith in the revelation of God. There's no way we can know these things without the revelation of God. And God makes that point. He asks that question to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Well, he doesn't need to give an answer. We all know he was where we were, nowhere. We weren't there. And so for us to know how it all began, we need to be told. It needs to be revealed. And we have that revelation. And we know it, as the author of Hebrews says, by faith. And that's all. But men today say, no, I don't believe that. I'm a materialist. I believe in science and reason. I'm a reasonable person. But human reason isn't reasonable. Not according to our text, not according to the prophet, since the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. You can't depend upon your reason. As long as men live in unbelief, deny God and His revelation, reject His sovereignty, and believe in their own sovereignty, their own autonomy. As long as they live as a law unto themselves, independently, they will never seek and find a solution to their condition. Let me illustrate. Joseph Lister is called the father of modern surgery. We can be thankful for Joseph Lister because his experiments proved Louis Pasteur's the theory of germs and revolutionized surgical procedures. Until really relatively recently, doctors thought infections were caused from miasma, bad air that was breathed in. So they didn't wash their hands or their instruments before or after surgery. And people died. Lister began washing hands and swabbing wounds with carbolic acid. The result was it reduced incidences of infection and saved lives. It proved the problem was not air but microbes, germs. If physicians don't know the origin of a problem, the cause of sickness, then they can't prescribe the solution or the cure and things will only get worse. And as long as men think the human condition is out of joint because of ignorance or the environment or the stars or whatever and refuse to see that the fault is in themselves, they won't be healed. But here is the problem. Here's the problem we all face because of that condition. Man can't see that. He can't fix his heart. It's deceptive. Men are self-deceived. Their foolish heart is darkened. The only solution to man's condition is a miracle from God. It's a miracle of grace. It's the miracle of the new heart. It's what, it's what Mark read before we began. It's what God promises later in chapter 24 and verse 7. I will give them a heart to know me. 
For I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. That's the promise of the new covenant, what Jeremiah prophesies later in chapter 31 at some length. So we don't stay in these dark chapters altogether. There is great light coming. There is great hope and great promise in, in those, those chapters. They, in Jeremiah's day, were living under the old covenant given by Moses with its laws and regulations. They weren't living under the new covenant. They had that hope, but they were living under the old covenant. And this chapter shows the weakness of that covenant. It was holy and good. That's what Paul says of the law in Romans chapter 7. But as he explains the law there and in Galatians 3 and other places, he makes it very clear that as good as the law was, because it's the revelation of God, the law could not change us. The law could not impart holiness to people. It could not enable obedience. It could do what it was intended to do, which was expose our failure. That's the purpose of the law. So God promised a new covenant with an obedient heart. His Son obtained it for us by His sacrifice. And the Holy Spirit gives it to us when He changes our heart through regeneration, through the new birth. That's the grace of God. And then the heart recognizes truth. Now it sees what it could not see. It tells us God is real, the gospel is true, and we believe as a result of that. Christ is the cure for all who know that they are sick and lost and look to Him for healing. We have a new heart. And that's the condition of every one of us as believers in Jesus Christ. We have a new heart. But still, we have sin. Sin is still in us. It's that law, it's that principle in our members that Paul also talks about in Romans 7. So even though we are a new creation in Christ, the wise child of God does not trust himself or herself. We live with motives hidden even to ourselves. I like this statement that the old Puritan Matthew Henry made. He expressed his uh, humble distrust of himself in his prayer. I need to repent of my repentance. I need my tears to be washed. That's a great statement. That's an insightful statement. I need to repent of my repentance. I need my tears washed. In other words, our best, the best we do is still imperfect. We're still infected with sin so that even our repentance isn't completely pure. Our tears aren't trustworthy. That means we need to look to the Lord for direction. We need to look to Him for correction. Wholly and completely, we need to look to Him for sanctification. And that's what Jeremiah indicates next in verse 10. We can't understand our own heart. Who can understand it, he asks. No one. No one but God. The Lord says here in verse 10 that He searches the heart. He examines and He tests the mind. He knows the thoughts and the motives the intentions of the heart of everyone. He knows what we can't possibly know of each other or know of ourselves. Nothing's hidden from Him. And as we look to Him, as we read His Word, He communicates to us where we're, we have failures and where we need to correct things and examine ourselves. And He rewards us, He says, according to what we are and have done, to give to every man according to to His ways, and where He, by His grace, brings us into obedience as we follow Him. He, bless, he blesses that. He blesses us in this life. He blesses us in the world to come with great rewards. But He also knows what's in the heart of the man who is not in, in believing in Him, and He deals with him according to His ways. And He, he makes that very clear in the verses that follow. But He speaks to our hearts and our minds and souls through His inerrant Word. That's why we need to pay attention to the Word of God and devote ourselves to it. That is how our sanctification occurs. The, the cleaning up and the strengthening of our heart, the restoration of our lives to the image of God. 
So as we study God's Word, He gives us understanding, increases our faith. We often hear, I want stronger faith. How do I get stronger faith? Well, Paul makes it very clear how in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We want stronger faith? Read the Scriptures. Devote yourself to the Word of God. It does that. It keeps us growing. It restores God's image in us. So as we do that, our faith increases, our wisdom increases. And so when our eyes tell us to, to live by sight, to lean on the arm of the flesh, take a bypath, a different path, we don't do that. We trust the Lord. We stay on His path. Look, one of the great frauds or deceptions of our age is materialism. The hope of security through possessions. It was a problem in Jeremiah's day as well as ours. He speaks of it in verse 11. Like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches but not by justice. In other words, who gets riches unjustly, improperly. In the midst of his days, they will leave him. And at the end, he will be a fool. This is a proverb based on a popular belief that the partridge would hatch eggs it didn't lay. The newly hatched birds would then flee when they recognized that the partridge wasn't their mother. The lesson is the person who gets wealth by unjust means or in a pursuit of worldliness will have it taken away. What he counts on for security will disappear. That's what Proverbs 23 verse 5 says. Wealth certainly makes wings for itself and flies away. It's the fool that trusts in it rather than trusting in the Lord. And Jeremiah was applying that proverb to Judah. It was a materialistic nation. You read this and you realize they had wealth. They had a wealthy class. And it was trusting in that. It was trusting in idols and, and in foreign powers for deliverance from the Babylonians. Trusting in material wealth for its security. Not trusting in the Lord. They were fools. And they would become captives. Now this is about Judah. That's the audience. That's what this is directed toward. But it's true of Christians too. John wrote to believers... Not to the world, but to believers in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, where he wrote, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. Now, why write that to Christians? Because we are prone to love the world, and we are prone to wander. We can be deceived, and we can seek our security just like the world does, seek our fulfillment like the world does in what we possess in money, and things. That's foolish. Wealth certainly makes wings for itself and flies away. Now, let me give this caveat. That's not saying, so don't work hard and don't save for the future. That's foolish. That's not the Word of God. We are to work hard. We're to be diligent. We're to be disciplined. Um, that's living to the glory of God in everything we do, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we're to live to the glory of God from the minor things to the big things. We're to live wise lives. And that would involve saving so we can provide for ourselves so that we can help others in time of need. But what the problem is, is not just working hard, but working to the exclusion of the Lord, neglecting Him and finding our source of uh, strength and confidence in the things of this world and what we've been able to accumulate and amass for ourselves. Neglecting the Lord is a great danger. And though we may amass a fortune, it won't save us in our dying day. When we all come to that end time, that end of our life, when we're on our deathbed, our wealth won't make any difference. Our security is in the Lord, believing His Word and obeying it, walking in the ancient paths, as Jeremiah put it in chapter 6. 
Judah's only hope was the Lord, from whom it had turned to follow other gods and other things. So in verse, verses 12 and 13, Jeremiah reminds the people of their hope and the danger of turning away. He begins praising the temple as the Lord's glorious throne which it was symbolically and only symbolically. Solomon, when he built the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, he says, this can't hold you. The, the, the world can't hold you. The universe can't hold you. But symbolically, that was his throne. And even as a symbol, it was a continual reminder to the people that God is enthroned over the universe and also among them. He is transcendent and He is imminent. He is over all things, the entire universe. The universe with all of its galaxies and all of its wonders and its vastness is like a speck of dust on His scale. And yet He dwells among us. They were His special people, His elect nation. The temple reminded of that, them of that. But the nation had fallen into the error of trusting in the building itself, just as they trusted in circumcision. It was a false assurance. In chapter 7, the Lord warned against that. He told them, you know, you trust in the temple. But I destroyed Shiloh before this, where the tabernacle had been set up, and he could destroy and would destroy Jerusalem. It's not the temple, but the one the temple represented that we trust in. The one, Isaiah said, sits above the circle of the earth who is enthroned over the universe. Buildings, idols, ceremonies are the things that, that they leaned upon while ignoring the true and living God. So, to make it clear beyond doubt, Jeremiah speaks explicitly of him. Verse 13 O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. The Lord is the hope because He is God. Now that was taught to the Israelites from the very beginning. It's the declaration of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 the basis of monotheism and the creed of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So hope is not found in anyone or anything else. The Lord alone is God, the, the triune God who is in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, who is personal. But Israel, like all people, clung to things for help and security. Our hope is in the personal God, God Almighty, who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, wisdom, truth, and power. He's all-knowing, just, and loving with a, a love that is unconditional. He makes promises and He keeps them. He's greater than anyone or anything, any situation in the universe. He's greater than that. He is all-sufficient, and He is our only hope. So it follows logically that if a person or nation turns away from Him, they abandon all hope. There's no hope for anyone who turns away from Him. Jeremiah says, they shall be written in the earth. That's an interesting expression written in the earth. It means that they will have no more stability or duration than the dust on the ground. They'll be blown away and disappear forever. The expression is also interesting because it may explain Jesus' action in John 8, verse 6, when the Pharisees brought a woman to Him caught in adultery and asked Him to judge her. He didn't say anything. Remember, He instead bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. What did he write? You wonder that. Commentators wonder that. We don't know, but it may be that he wrote these words. You shall be written in the earth. 
Maybe he wrote their names individually in the dust to say, you too are guilty and unrepentant. You shall be written in the earth. Well, they got the message and they all quietly left in shame. We can't be certain whether this verse is what he wrote in the ground. Augustine suggested that it was, and some of the modern commentators have taken that view as well. What Jeremiah was certainly saying is there is no hope outside of the Lord. He alone is God. And he adds at the end of the verse, he is the fountain of living water. Now Christ was certainly referring to that in John chapter 4 verse 10 when he offered the woman at the well of Samaria living water. And in John chapter 7 and verse 38 when he promised the nation rivers of living water. Living water, what is that? Well, literally, materially, it's flowing water. So you get the sense. It, it moves. It's living it's not a pond, but a stream. It's a river. And in the arid Middle East, that was a great blessing. It is fresh and refreshing. It is life. Now here it's a, a metaphor. It's an inviting illustration of spiritual life. Who in a hot, dry land would not want living water? Rivers of it. Well, everyone in Jeremiah's day, everyone to whom he preached would have wanted cool water from a stream. But they weren't interested in the spiritual water, eternal life from the Lord. They thought they had that. They didn't need what Jeremiah was talking about. They're closing him off in all of this. They didn't need his living water because they had circumcision. They had the temple. We're okay. Their hearts deceived them. So as Jeremiah prophesied in verses 5 and 6, they were cursed. Having rejected living water, they would be like a bush in a desert and a land of salt, a dry, desiccated, withering spiritual wilderness. And that was Jeremiah's great sorrow. He loved his people. And he saw their response of unbelief to the prophecies that he gave. And he saw that judgment was certain to come and they would suffer. That was why he was the weeping prophet. But also their rejection of him added to that. They thought he was a false prophet. They abused him. And you, can, you know, in fact, you know as you read the book, and you get the, the personal response of Jeremiah as it's recorded here, that that took a great toll upon him, as it would anybody. So in verses 14 through 18, Jeremiah asks the Lord to strengthen him. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. We all need that. If we're fighting the good fight every day, we get tired, we get discouraged. Life can be very difficult. But the Lord who sits on the circle of the earth who directs the planets and all of the galaxies, the one who is in control of it all and in fact holds it all together by the word of his power, he refreshes his people. He's well able to do it. So Jeremiah looked to him and God strengthened the prophet and every day he went out and he lived as a prophet. He preached the truth to the people, the people whose sin was written on their heart with a pen of iron. Well, that description of Judah applies to every unbeliever. Sin is inscribed on their soul deeply, indelibly, like words chiseled in marble. And one of the terrible realities of perdition one of the terrible realities of the lake of fire is the guilty will know their sin fully and feel the shame of it completely and forever. It's what Isaiah describes as the worm that never dies, the gnawing guilt that will drive people mad. That's what awaits the unbeliever whose sin has been written 
with a pen of iron. But Christ removes that. That's the good news. That's the gospel that men think is foolishness, but is the great hope of mankind. He makes our heart like a palimpsest. And you ask, what is that? What is a palimpsest? Well, a palimpsest is a scroll or page of parchment that ancient scribes would reuse. Writing articles were expensive and hard to come by, and so sometimes they would take an old scroll, something written on vellum, some valuable article, maybe even a parchment, and they would reuse it. They would scrape off all of the old ink, or they'd wash off all of the old black ink, and they would clean up the document, and then they would reuse it and write their own new manuscript on it. Well, that's what the blood of Christ has done for every believer. He has washed away our sins and, and written deeply in our, our heart His own words. Removed the pen of iron and written great words, forgiven forever. Written on our heart, obedience. And gives that obedience. Gives new life. Life that is eternal with new abilities to live well to God's glory and to man's benefit. That's the good news. So if you feel the weight of sin, come to Christ. Believe in Him and be saved. And then by God's grace, live for Him. Live an obedient life in the strength and the power that He gives. May God help all of us to do that. Let's end with a hymn. Let's stand and sing number 25 in the songs of praise before the throne of God above and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 25. Father, by your grace, you've given us hearts of flesh that replace our hearts of stone. You've given us new hearts. You've written your law upon them so that we can see things that we could not see apart from that grace. And we can confess what we have just sung, that Christ is our Savior and our God. Thank you for sending him and the salvation that he's, he has obtained for your people, for everyone who puts their trust in him. Thank you for him. It's in his name we pray. Amen.